Welcome to the I Love Recruiting Podcast with your host, Adam Roach. Welcome, welcome, welcome to, uh, welcome back to, first of all, the I Love Recruiting Podcast. And if you're watching this live on the Art of Recruiting uh, Facebook group, welcome. I have my friend, uh, I, you know, th this guy entrepreneurially has blown it out of the water. Mr. Justin Stoddard is here today with us. Let me let me back up. Amazing father of six kids, right? <laughs> six yeah. kids. I don't know about the amazing part, but yes, yeah, six kids, I can confirm. <laughs> Host of the bigger real estate podcast show, which I've been honored to be a guest on, yeah. and an international best-selling author of the book Upstream Model, right? That's right, yeah. All right, man, it's yours. Tell us all about yourself. Go for it. Dude, I love it. So I'll start with the part that I love the most. Again, I've been married for, uh, what's it, 14? No, 15 years. My wife's going to kill me. Um, and uh, we've got six children. And uh, I'll tell you, I actually had the question yesterday, how do you possibly give them all attention? And I say, um, you know, I spend, I dedicate each night of the week to one of my kids. So Monday mm -hmm. is Malia, Tuesday is Corbin. And they get, you know, 20 minutes of us time, no interruptions, and uh, so that's how I manage that. That's again, the joy of my life, kind of my biggest why, which is the deep motivator. Um, I come out of the home building industry. Okay. 2003, I was a high-end home builder working for a general contractor. Uh, there was lots of opportunity. Um, when the market crashed in 2008, 2009, I realized my passion really was not developing land and building homes. It was really developing people and building business. Nice. And so that became really kind of a, a, a crossroads for me is it had I loved building homes, I would have continued and kind of stuck through those gnarly five years of not much going on. Uh, but I didn't love it. Really, it was, it was the business and the development of people that I loved. And uh, so I sought out a career in a business that allowed me to really develop people to build business. And uh, I was actually recruited into the title and escrow industry um, with some hesitation because people around me said, you're going to be super bored doing that. Don't do that. And um, the person who actually um, recruited me in said, hey, look, top producing real estate agents um, really are somewhat kind of untouchable by mm -hmm. title reps. Like big mm. top agents don't have a lot of time and attention and interest in meeting with title reps simply because they can't solve their biggest problems. He said, I'm looking at recruiting a different caliber of people. So you can kind of, again, this being the recruiting uh, mecca of the world, right? Everybody here kind of learning high level stuff. He casted a vision for me of that. This is kind of where the normal status quo person operates I'm going to create something different. I'm going to, mm. I'm going to build something different and you're going to help me pioneer this. We're going to bring in people who have actually owned their own businesses to actually work in the title and escrow uh, industry. We're going to launch a new title company here in the area and you're going to be part of it. And it's going to allow us to, with your expertise to go get bigger clients because you can actually help solve their problems. And so I think if there's one thing that maybe ties in that everybody here has an interest in is how do you recruit top talent? Well, right. You've got to cast a big vision. You've got to actually give them something to get excited about. Um, and uh, that's kind of what, what I saw at the time. And, um, you know, as I got into the industry, I realized that the status quo, and I think everybody can probably relate to this because I went from being the recruited to mm -hmm. being the recruiter really quickly. I had to somehow sure. convince top real estate agents who were in love with their escrow and title people to move their business to us. Essentially, I was in a recruiting role, right? right. Not having them come work for us, but I had to get them to move their business to us. And I realized that when I showed up in their space, I showed up as a solicitor, right? It's mm. like, ah, here comes another title rep. And so I had to quickly change. I had to figure out a way to change their paradigm because the kind of the, the typical way about going about it was I'll befriend them. I'll offer friendship as my first value proposition. I'll, I'll, I'll be chummy. I'll take them to lunch. I'll take them golfing. And, you know, I got six kids. I don't have time to be like spending all my <laughs> evenings out with right. other people, whining and dining them, trying to be friends with people. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, that I realized, Adam, is that the people that, that I was working with, they didn't need more friends. They had plenty of friends. In fact, they were having a hard time keeping in contact with all their friends and their own database. The last thing they needed was to spend time with another title person, making friendships. So that, that aligned with where I was at. 
I had to realize that what is their biggest problem? Well, it's either they need more listings, more leads and more leverage. And so how could I go about solving those problems? And it actually took me back to my home building days. At the time I was 25 years old and I was, I had been building high-end custom homes for somebody else left and started my own company thinking it would be just as easy to, to, to attract high-end home building clients kind of forgot the fact of looking in the mirror and realizing I was 25 and looked more like 18. And I was, I needed them to entrust me with a million, $2 million to build them their mm -hmm. dream home. And so I had to figure out a way to, 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 to get access to the customer sooner than all my competition. I had to somehow find a way to, to move out of the role of being a solicitor and a vendor into the role of being really a peer, being a mentor and a leader, someone that they looked up to and needed, not just liked, but needed. And so um, that those same principles I utilized in my role in the title and escrow industry, I utilized them by saying, okay, um, as a high-end home builder, I had to figure out how to become really valuable to architects. Not just mm -hmm. the fact that I could build a good home, but I had to really bring strong value that they couldn't get from any other builder, right? And so those same principles I began to apply as a title and escrow representative of like, how do I offer such value that they don't just like me, right? Mm. But they need me. They realize that they can get to their best business than their better life by having me working with them as opposed to not working with them. And I think that's one of the key things that I've learned about, um, you know, recruiting and, and, and this whole game that, that, that you guys are so expert at is that you have to be able to offer something that they can't get anywhere else, right? right? You have to make mm -hmm. that super clear. And uh, in kind of that whole process of trying to figure out how to create my own identity in this new industry, um, I then realized that, okay, I need to somehow help real estate agents because that's their biggest problem is how do they get more leads? How do they get more listings? How do they get more leverage? All these things that kind of we all know are, are essential. Um, how do I actually move the needle for them in those things? And so mm -hmm. again, I lean back on those experiences as a high-end home builder in my own role as a title and escrow representative. And I began to realize that there were some common trends there um, that I then formulated into an actual model called the upstream model. In fact, here's a, here's a copy of it here. Um, so this book actually was just released as uh, Adam mentioned, sorry, the glare is a little strong there. Got it. Um, but that book, um, this book, in this book, it, it kind of tells my story of how to sell better, right? How to not just show up as a common vendor, how to show up as a commodity. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of title reps. There's a lot of lenders. There's a lot of real estate agents. There's a lot of brokerages, right? There's, there's no shortage of offers for people to accept. Right. But there is a unique, like there is a shortage of those that can offer superior value, right? That can really move the needle for people. And so that's really where um, kind of this book started was really looking back at my history to say, how did I get multimillionaires to entrust a kid like me to build their dream home? Oh yeah. And I started to kind of realize that there were some common threads there. And, and how did I show up in an industry that nobody really respected as a business builder in the title and escrow? How did I, how did I get top agents to start moving their business to me? And I started to realize that, Hey, there's something here that I think is really valuable for people. And it's this concept and feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm just going yeah. off here. No, no, no. I'm taking a lot of notes here. I will come back to them, but this is great. <laughs> so what I realized is that at any given time, and so I'll kind of speak to, 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 again, I teach, train a lot of real estate agents now. And I realized that at any given time, most real estate agents kind of find themselves going to one of two camps. One camp is I'm going to go cold market. I'm going to buy internet leads through Boomtown, through Commission Zinc, through Zillow. And I'm going to follow up with those people like crazy. I'm going to answer my phone whenever it rings because I know that that's money calling me, right? right. Or the potential for money. Uh, I have a very good friend who, who is, a, is an ISA and he kind of shared the numbers with me. And, and you guys probably all understand this. And, and this is a business model. This is not to discredit it, but I think we need to look at the reality of it. So he said that they convert on Google pay-per-click and maybe people are getting better, you know, thing like better, uh, you know, um, results in other places. But he said, we get about three to 4% conversion on pay-per-click, but the average actually convert time is about 600 days. So a couple of years, they're following up with hundreds of people, right? A hundred people, let's say to get four of them. Wow. So yep. I think you just need to be clear that that's a model and you just have to be very diligent at answering the phone, at calling it, following up, 
And, um, and, and my, my concern with that is that there's 96 people who, you, who didn't choose you and 96 people who maybe didn't have the greatest experience because you were calling when they didn't want you to call, right? Right. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily good for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, now, some people do it totally respectfully and people actually leave edified and feeling good afterwards. There's a whole bunch that don't, right? And so I think that that's, that's a concern. And, and for some of us who are very relational, we just don't want to do business that way. Again, not judging anybody who does and kills it, good for you. But I know there's a lot of people who are like, I'd rather actually call people who are like eager to take my call, right? right? So that leads us to the second camp, which is I work by referral, right? Word of mouth, work by referral. Oh, by the way, I'm never too busy for referrals, right? That whole camp, which is kind of what I would place myself in. Like, that's how I'd prefer to work. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, is I've worked with hundreds of agents, is that your database doesn't always give you the referrals at the speed and the propensity um, and the frequency that you want or need. And so what ends up happening is that you're like, man, I, I want to close 35 to 40 deals a year, but my database has only given me 20 to 25. And I'm loving on this group of 250 to 300 people, right? Just like kind of the people that are serving the cold market, right? They've got a database of maybe a thousand people, a couple thousand people that they're following up on. In the warm market, I've got, I'm trying to keep my arms around, keep top of mind, doing pop buys, doing client events, all this stuff for 250 people. And really, I'm, it's, it's bringing out, you know, maybe about 10% of that is, is offering a, refer, you know, a referral each year. And that's not aligned with my wants, maybe not even my needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, where does that leave that person that wants to work relationally, that wants to work by referral? Well, they start maybe filling the gaps with going back to cold leads. Maybe I'll buy some internet leads. And then they go back and they're like, their hand gets slapped. They're like, man, I just don't want to do business that way. Right. So where does that leave us? And I think if we understand the 80-20 principle, right? The, the you know, 80, 20 rule Pareto's principle. We realize that in that database of 250 people, there's, there's a few in there that'll actually give you a lot of referrals. Right. That'll actually, that can really help you. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes those are classified as a plus clients or, you know, VIP clients or whatever. The upstream model teaches you to identify people in the marketplace that can really help you. So for example, I've interviewed dozens of financial advisors and those financial advisors, like um, unanimously have said, when I've asked the question, when I say, do you know that a real estate transaction is coming in your client's future? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Like the good ones that actually get in and, and do the work of advising and consulting and counseling, they actually understand that, yes, I, I actually ask my clients, what are your plans with your primary residence? Are you planning on buying you know, other properties? Are you going to get rid of your you know, rental properties, they, they, they know these things are coming. And then my follow-up question is, great. So when you uncover those, you know, 18 to 24 opportunities a year, which is what I'm finding on average, um, are you referring that to a real estate agent? And mm -hmm. almost unanimously, no, I'm not. It's like, wow. Okay. Interesting. So one relationship has the potential to deliver what an entire database of 250 people can deliver you. Right. They're just simply not referring that business. So I began to uncover why not. Now, the fact that I'm not a licensed real estate agent, like not a lic licensed real estate agent myself, mm -hmm. they actually will level with me and tell me, well, here's why. Now, if I were, they'd probably be like, oh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't really get opportunities like that, right? Like if you right. approach a financial advisor and you're a real estate agent, they'd probably kind of put the, their guard up, right? Kind of like that first architect did when I went to them to say, hey, I understand you're an architect and you can refer me a home builder business. Here's 10 of my cards please refer me. By the way, here's all the initials behind my name. Here's all the reasons why you should refer me, right? Because we right. show up as a solicitor, as a, mm -hmm. as a vendor. And so I began to really unpack and uncover why are these individuals... Now, now financial advisor is one example, right? The reality is there are people throughout the marketplace that in their day-to-day -day work, what they do for a living, they're in conversations with their clients and they're either uncovering or are one or two questions away from uncovering the fact that a real estate move is in their future. Right. And if we added enough value to that person, and if we train them on how to turn that into a, oh, so you're probably in need of a really good realtor, aren't you? Like that would actually turn into a flow of warm referrals. Because I believe that actually agents don't really want more cold leads. Like that's actually not what they want. No. What they actually want is more warm referrals but how do I do? Do I just add more people to my database? Now I've got 500 people to try and keep my arms around. No, it's apply, it's apply the 80, 20 principle to your database. 
and then do it again and again and again. And you find people in there and it's, it's most likely maybe not even people in there. It's adding people to it Mm -hmm. who as their day job, they're not having to go out of their way and, Oh yeah, I know. And I like, and I trust Adam. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to remember when my aunt Susie says she needs a a realtor, I'm going to think of her at that time. That's so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But if you find people who in their day-to-day work are already uncovering this and you give them enough incentive by adding enough value to them and their business and their clients, then all of a sudden it becomes supernatural and they're not referring you because they know you like you trust you. They're referring you because they actually need you because just like you, they're trying to stand out. They're trying to differentiate themselves from the big tech offerings that are, you know, online services. They're trying to differentiate themselves from other financial advisors. And so by you adding value to them and to their client experience, you come up in every conversation right at the unique moment when they're talking about real estate. And so that's one example, right? But there's literally dozens of people within our society that can help us with that. The upstream model goes through and really helps you to identify like, who are these people? Right. How do I identify who they are? And then how do I approach them? So I don't come in like I did to the architects initially, right? Or like maybe many of you had of like, oh, I heard this idea. I'm going to go, I know, a, I know a financial advisor. I'm going to call him today and give him 10 of my cards. Like that won't work. You're going to burn that bridge. Don't do it. Justin, right? well, the, <clears throat> I mean, already a whole page <laughs> of notes here. Way to go. I want to stop you for a second because here's what we're, here's what we can do with that. When I say we, I mean, anybody that's in a recruiting space, let's just say specifically in the real estate world. Yeah. I coach too. And I hear broker owners, managers, team leaders, agents that are solely recruiting, uh, go through this, this, this one, two, and three of where to find my leads. Yeah. Where, when their leads are probably right underneath their nose, right. In their own agents, right. Getting referrals from their own agents from an 80, 20 principle, knowing that if they have a hundred agents, they're not going to get a hundred leads from one, per, every single person, they might get a hundred leads from a top 20%, right. Or they might get leads from the first 10 people that they pour enough value into. Am I hearing you right there? Yeah, it's it's exactly right. The, the, these principles, mm-hmm. the upstream model p- principles can be applied to almost anything, right? Totally. And it's kind of what you're saying here, Adam, is yes, there are people within, let's say that you your job is to recruit to a brokerage. Mm-hmm. Um, you have, let's say, 200 agents in your brokerage. Mm-hmm. 200 people are not going to give you referrals at the same frequency and propensity as others. So who are the people that can really help you? And, and I think the bigger question is, is, which is the upstream question, which is who knows that an agent is going to move brokerages before they ever start talking to brokerages? Right. right? I mean, that's the upstream question is like, who, who is actually knows that this is going to happen before they actually go start shopping? And it's those people, those are the people that you want to be in relationship with and adding such value to them to where not, again, they're not doing it just because they know you like your trust and they want to do you a favor. It's because it actually makes their business and their life better, right? Mm -hmm. That you're adding to, to, to them in such a way that they actually need you. I think they want to help you. No, they need to help you because they need the value that you're bringing them. Well, and then that's something that I underlined here along with a lot of other things, um, refer because they need you right mm-hmm. no like and trust fantastic there's that relationship that we always talking about however you're bringing that individual enough value and let, let's just take a lender or even a title person or or, or a, who else could we throw in that boat um, um a contractor right yeah. that you build an outside relationship with that have relationships with other agents if we're talking solely about recruiting inside the real estate space here they refer because they need you love yeah. that that's great that's great gold nugget there yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. So it's, um, again, these principles are, are, um, can really shift a couple of things for you. Number one, it allows you to have more time with your actual clients, right? With your, let's see, you know, if you're in a recruiting role, it actually rather than, again, than spending time with 96 people who are not going to convert. And again, I'm using real estate online lead numbers here, right? Mm-hmm. 96 people who aren't convert aren't going to convert. You can actually hone in. It takes you less time to get a lead, right? Wow. And it takes you less time to convert that lead. And you can reinvest that back into your client experience mm-hmm. or back into your family, right? right. Like yeah. I, like one of the downsides, this, I, I was trying to see the downside 
um, of a warm market business. And some, some, some agents have kind of revealed this to me over the years. Cause you think like there's, that's absolutely the best way you're, you're, you're interacting with your friends all the time. Right. And the first big aha that I uncovered was that, well, the, like you don't get referrals at the timeliness or the frequency that you always want them to, right? right. You're kind of beholden to them and you can love on them and you can pop by and yeah. you all these things and that helps. But these people that you're loving on their day-to-day -day work is not necessarily interacting with people and uncovering these conversations, right? So who is uncovering those conversations? The second thing that I realize is that oftentimes when people are not, um, like when they're dealing with their database, it's hard to sometimes turn work off. If you just want to go out with friends, you don't necessarily want to be talking about real estate or being this mm -hmm. opportunist. Um, it, it's sometimes nice to kind of leave work at work and almost treat this as a B2B model. Right. I think that's why some people even kind of migrate to like commercial, um, you know, real estate is because I actually on, I want to actually kind of have some time off on my weekends where I'm not feeling like evenings and weekends, I'm supposed to be lead generating. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I would rather be able to pour value into a B2B partner during the week and have him refer his clients to me. And those clients are totally okay with me calling him back on Monday because of the way that he's introduced me. Right. Right. And so I think that there's a number of different benefits the time that you spend doing the work, whether it be recruiting or whether it be lead generating goes down, the conversion goes up. And again, you're able to reinvest that back into relationships that matter even more. That's so, so, so good. And I trust everyone who's listening uh, right now, whether you're in the art of recruiting, you're hearing this. And if you are, and you have a question for Justin, put it in the, uh, the thread right now uh, from this live stream. And if you're listening to us, on the I Love Recruiting podcast when this airs, which will probably be in two weeks, um, rewind what he just said and listen to that again, because that was really, really good. So Justin, let's do this. Um, man, because this is, this is really, really good. When we're talking about adding superior value, right? Can you give the audience a few examples of what that would mean? Now, we know that there's no one size shoe fits all when it comes to value, because everybody's going to be uniquely different there because value is value in their own definition. What have you seen is a superior value period? What, what, what have you yeah, seen there? Yeah. I think oftentimes what we tend to do is we tend to work within our little silos. For example, I'll use, you know, the industry that I come out of, for example, title and escrow, which is okay. The value that a typical title and escrow can offer is faster turn times. We can offer um, better technology. And, and like, we always think about what I do for a living and I'm going to do it better than the next guy, right? It's just a little bit better commodity is, is what we're saying for a real estate agent. For example, if we were to approach an upstream partner, okay. We could say like, Hey, I'm a real estate agent and I sold 50 deals where you probably only know people that sold 40 deals. Like it's much, it's kind of the same thing. And we're, 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 we're not really solving the problem of the upstream partner, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you say superior value, I think we have to look beyond what we do for a living. We have to look for problems that our profession doesn't necessarily solve. That's where you really start to set yourself apart because the, everybody in your industry claims to market and sell a home really well, right? Everybody claims to have um, you know, a great client experience, but what are problems that the typical realtor doesn't solve? So for example, right, um, a real estate agent in a lot of cases, when a, you know, when a, um, when they're working with their clients, it's not common for them to say, Hey, I see that you're selling a home and not buying another one. Mm -hmm. You've got congratulations on all that equity that you've built up over the years. What I found part of my client experience is that I encourage you to talk to a trusted financial advisor, maybe even a tax advisor, mm -hmm. because what you do with this money can compound and turn into more and more or you can end up giving more to the government than you want. So if, you, if you're open to it, I'm happy to refer you to somebody who specializes in looking at that and giving good advice on that, right? That would be an example of, to your clients, offering superior value to them that other real estate agents probably aren't thinking of. They're probably thinking of, um, you know, like, is there, you know, I'll drop by pizza while you're unloading the truck, which is awesome, don't get me wrong. How, how do you solve problems that other people in your profession aren't solving? Now, mm -hmm. when you look the other way and say, how do I offer superior value to an upstream partner, right? One is obviously giving them referrals, making their business part of your client experience, just like the example I just shared, right? right. Which is where you have 
um, all of a sudden now you're reaching out to the financial advisor to say, hey, I just had a client who's, who again, you know, sold and is, is not buying. Would you mind um, just kind of take a look at their situation and see if there's any, in, you know, any input. But again, don't think so small as to consider that, that the only value you can offer them is a referral because it's not. When we think that way, we really limit ourselves. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that I uncovered when I was speaking with uh, financial advisors, they said, yeah, referrals are nice, but like a lot of them have their client base intact. Like they can't take on any more clients. That's right. not even what they want. Mm -hmm. What they're looking for is something uh, that's, that really makes their client experience, helps retain their clients. You, you, you have to look at and to answer your question, Adam, what is the biggest challenge that this person is facing, regardless if my industry can solve it or not? So for a financial advisor, as I've, as I've met with them and consulted with them, it's number one, having enough clients, right? Yep. But even beyond that, it's being sure that their clients are loyal to the plan that they created for them. They get paid typically based on like how much money is in their portfolio, right? That right. That's be being invested with that particular client. And so how do you be sure that, 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 that their clients aren't being poached by these online right, companies that are offering to manage their money for them? Hmm. And, and so again, you have to just take a look at what's the biggest problem that this professional is faced with right now? What's the biggest threat to their business? And how do I fortify that? Okay, so one of the things that a real estate agent can do with a financial advisor is be help them to be more of a holistic advisor. So rather mm -hmm. than just being an advisor that says, okay, let's review your, your investments, right, in the market. Hey, let's also take a look at your real estate. I have a very close contact who's given me uh, you know, a CMA on your home. Um, and I just like, let's, let's take a look at kind of how your total net worth is showing up here. Not based off his estimate, but somebody who actually took a look at the numbers and the comps in your neighborhood. Um, now, all of a sudden you've made that financial advisor be more valuable to his clients. Right. right. Um, and so he's naturally going to bring you up in those conversations because you're the one that gave him that information, but right. more importantly, you've made him more valuable. And so you've helped him to solve a problem and to be at the center of all things financial which is ultimately what that um, financial advisor wants to be. He wants to be, every time there's a financial decision going on in their life about real estate, about anything, he right. wants to be checked in with to see if that's a good idea, if it's according to their plan. And if you can help facilitate that and keep those clients loyal to that plan and make him intelligent about all things financial, now all of a sudden he's more valuable to those clients and, and there's a better chance that they're going to be stick on plan and stick with him. Justin, this, this has been extremely valuable. I know all of our listeners on the I Love Recruiting podcast will hear the value presented and in the art of recruiting. Uh, we've definitely had some people, here we go, add the value on the annual basis for all these clients, uh, business partner, not a recruiter. We've got all kinds of three L's of listing. This is so good. Where can people find you? Where can they go get the book? Uh, tell us more about that. And I'll even share with your permission, your uh, the, the media thing that you sent me, if you want me to, in the art of recruiting, happy to promote you, man, because this has been extremely valuable. Yeah, appreciate it. So the book, if you're interested in it, uh, it's the Upstream Model. And uh, you can get the book at upstreammodel.com forward slash book. Um, and I actually have it as a, as a just under cost. I'm actually kind of giving the book away because I believe in the material. There's an upsell there that will get you the audio offering. Okay. And it will also give you an interview with a financial advisor that I did. It's, it, it wasn't a podcast interview. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation saying, look, Mr. Financial Advisor, if a real estate agent did this, would you start giving in business? And he was like, yes, I've never had an agent do that. And that would be wildly valuable. So that's included in that audio package upgrade. So that was uh, upstreammodel.com backslash book or forward slash book. That's right. Yep. I got it. Yep. And then, um, and then there's a course when he's interested in kind of going deep and kind of a group coaching environment upstreammodel.com forward slash course gives people the ability to work um, in kind of a group setting uh, to help implement this into your business. So that's another option, upstreammodel.com forward slash course. So forward slash course. All right, my friend, I just put all of that in our notes right there in the okay. art of recruiting. Justin, I appreciate you. I appreciate the value that you just brought to all of our, all of our group members, all of our I Love Recruiting podcast listeners. Uh, this has been great. You all know where to go find him. You can find him on Instagram, two forward slash his first name and his last name, Justin Stoddard. Uh, find him on Facebook at the same spot, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, perfect. 
And yeah, my website, uh, uh, justinstoddart.com. There's a T at the end, not a D. That's probably an easy way where you can get kind of access to all this stuff I'm talking about. So yeah, it's fantastic. And, and your website, man, that, that, thing, that thing is beautiful. That's a great looking website. Yeah. So everybody, uh, you know where to go find Justin now. Go get his book. Go check him out. Go play with his courses. Justin, I appreciate you. Uh, I love being in the groups that we are in together. And thank you for uh, jumping on the podcast here with us today. And uh, yeah, we'll see you around, my friend. Thanks for being here. Such a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for everything. All right. Take care. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.